Hello, welcome to the Maya Tool Belt. This is Michael. Today we're going to talk about the spring constraint. You can find these under the effects module under fields and solvers, create spring constraint. If we can go into the options. If you've been following along with our constraint series so far, we've gone over most of the constraint types, including nail, pin, and hinge. So if you want to check out those three tutorials, you can click those links and check out those videos going over those constraint types. And as I mentioned in those videos, the constraint options window is actually the options for all of the constraint types, not just the spring constraint type, which is what we're talking about today. If I were to change the constraint type to a different type, such as hinge, we would get the settings that go with hinge become available in our window. If I go to edit and reset settings, you'll see that by default the constraint type changes to nail and we don't necessarily want to do that we want to go back to spring but now we can be sure that we have our default settings within our constraint options now you'll see that we have a set initial position checkbox and an inner penetrate checkbox for the spring constraint type there's also down here we have spring attributes which include stiffness damping set spring rest length, which if we check that, the rest length slider becomes available. So I'm just going to keep it at default values for now, and we need an object to apply the spring constraint to. So I'm going to minimize this, and I'll just create a polygon cylinder, scale that up a little bit, and I'll hide my grid for now. I'll take out the subdivisions caps also, just so we have a, uh, a clean cylinder. So with the cylinder selected, I go back to my constraint options, and with the spring constraint type, nothing else changed, I can hit apply. Before I do that though, there is the constraint name up here. If you want to name your constraint, you can do so by typing in something here. If you don't type in anything, it'll use a default constraint name instead of any name that you choose. I'm just going to leave it blank for now, and hit create. So first, I don't really see anything happen, you'll, but you'll see I have the, the rigid spring constraint 1 selected here. And if I hit the 4 for my wireframe view, you can see it right there. And I can move it around. And you can see as I move it, it's this little square icon with a line that goes to the center of mass of my cylinder. And this is the spring constraint. I'm going to undo my movement so it's still at the center of the cylinder. And in order to see the spring constraint really do anything, we'll need to play an animation so that we can see the dynamics being calculated. So I'm going to go to Display, UI Elements, and I'll break off this little UI Elements line here and choose Time Slider and Range Slider, and close this. And in the Range Slider, I'm just going to, well, it says 120 here, I'm going to type in like 500, hit Enter, so we have a lot of frames to play with. So now I hit Rewind and Play in my Playback Controls. The animation is playing, but nothing's really happening. The reason why is because the way the spring constraint works is you have to kind of pull back the spring and then let go and watch the spring kind of bounce around. The spring being the spring constraint. So I'm going to grab this and just pull it back here. I can go back to shaded view. So by pulling this up back over here, I've kind of pulled the spring tight, ready to bounce. So now when I hit play, the cylinder kind of bounces back and forth between that point. So whenever the spring constraint icon was within the center of the, of the cylinder and hit play, nothing really happened. But when I pulled it back like this, it then started bouncing around. And you'll notice that as, as it plays, and, and I've gone back to the start of my animation, but as it got toward the end of my timeline, you can see how the springiness of it is receding. It's kind of becoming less and less bouncy and getting toward the center of the spring constraint. So I'll stop that and rewind. And this is our position as it is so far. So that's essentially basics of how the spring constraint works. You kind of pull it back and let it go. But there are some op options we can play with. Over here on the right you'll see we have our rigid spring constraint options and channels within the channel box. And below visibility we have constraint type. We can change our constraint type to a pin or a nail or whatever if we wanted to. And then we have spring stiffness, spring damping, spring rest length right here. Then also interpenetrate and constrain on and off. So spring stiffness, damping, and 
spring rest length. If we went back to our spring constraint options and opened up the spring attributes, you'll see we have our same settings here. Stiffness, damping, and then spring rest length, which we can turn on or off here and set that with this slider. So these options in the channel box are those options. It's just this is where we can edit those after we've already created the spring. So spring stiffness. Let me go ahead and play the animation let it and let it bounce and I can adjust these settings while it's bouncing and you can see the effect it has on the bounce of the spring. So I'm going to hit play and you can watch it go back and forth. So spring stiffness right now is 5. Let's increase this to say 20 and hit enter. You can see it goes much faster. Stop it, rewind. So back at the beginning, hit play. You see with a higher spring stiffness, it's really moving quite quickly. Stop and rewind. Let's try a spring stiffness of say one and hit play. Let's see now it's quite slow. So spring stiffness is kind of how fast that spring pulls back and forth on the object. Then we have spring damping and the default value is 0.1. You'll notice as the spring plays between frame 1 and 500, which is what we have here, the spring does eventually kind of start to slow down and not spring quite so far. You see it here, it's kind of slowing down, not going nearly as far as it was at the beginning. As it gets to the end of our timeline, it's much closer to the middle of the constraint, bouncing slowly back and forth through here. And that is how fast the spring effect is damping or diminishing over time. So with a spring damping of 0.1, that's what we get. If I increase this to say 0.5 and hit play, you can see that effect becomes much faster. You can see it already is getting toward the middle and it's going to soon stop moving. So spring damping is how fast that springiness goes away and slows down and becomes at rest. So the smaller the spring damping, the longer it takes for the spring to slow down. Then you have your spring rest length. Right now the spring rest length is zero. And this is based on the length of the spring and where the spring is trying to get to for its rest position. And with the spring rest length of zero, it's trying to get back to this position where the spring constraint little box is. And that's the zero position. If I increase this, let's say a spring rest length of something much higher, like 10. Hit enter. And let's increase my spring damping just so it comes to its uh, rest position but much faster. Let's try a spring damping of 1. Hit play. So with a spring rest length of 10, and increasing the spring damping to up to one so that the spring will become at rest much sooner we can see what happens and you can see now that that rest position is way over here which is about 10 units away from the spring constraints uh, starting point here so then we have interpenetrate which is turned off by default and what that does is if there's two objects that are constrained together with a spring constraint interpenetrate when interpenetrate is off the two objects will collide together. When interpenetrate is on, they will pass through each other, and we can demonstrate that. Let's go back to the constraint options here, and I'll actually delete the current spring constraint that we have. We also have a set initial position box. If we check this box, we can change the initial position XYZ values. And what this is, is where in relation to the origin of the scene does the spring start? If you don't check this set initial position box, it uses the center of the cylinder as its position to start at. If I show the grid, you can see this is the origin over here. So if I were to set initial position and choose a value like a Y value of 5 and let's say a Z value of 10 or something like that, and then hit create, you see the spring starts over here, which is 5 units high and 10 units over in the positive Z axis direction. And when I did that, you'll notice that the spring rest length is set to 11.049. So it uses that length of the spring itself to give you the spring rest length. Whenever we didn't choose a initial position, 
that spring rest length was zero, which was right here at the center of the cylinder. If I move the cylinder over here now and hit play, you can see how the object reacts. We can also apply dynamic forces to the object. Let's say if we select the cylinder and go to Fields and Solvers, Gravity, just apply some gravity to it and I'll hide the grid again. Hit rewind and play. You can see now that cylinder is trying to fall and the spring is kind of bringing it back up with its springiness. So let's go back to the options. Create spring constraint options and that's with set initial position turn on. You can change that position there. I'll reset settings and go back to my spring. So interpenetrate on or off. Let's go ahead and delete all of this. I'll delete the gravity as well. And I'll create, let's just say a uh, cone. Cones are fun. I have this cone shape. And I'm going to duplicate it and have another cone over here. And just for fun, I'll rotate this one around like this. So here's our two cones. I'll select one, shift select the other, and create. So we've created a spring constraint between these two objects. When I hit play right now, you'll see nothing really happens. And also, when you have two objects constrained together like this, the set initial position doesn't really matter. So I can move this thing around, and it doesn't really affect what happens when I hit play. I'll move over here and hit play. Nothing really happens. And that's because the objects themselves now are the anchor points for the spring. If I were to now move this cone over here, for example, rewind, hit play, now they are starting to react together like this. And you'll notice with interpenetrate turned off, the two objects will collide together, like so. If I were to select the spring constraint and turn interpenetrate on, rewind and play, they pass right through each other. Let's turn it back off for now. So yeah, you can get some fun results using spring constraints. Don't forget there's also gravity and collisions and such. If I move this cone to up here, and let's go ahead and just make a little scene, so to speak. I'll create a plane. And the plane, I will go to Fields and Solvers, create a passive rigid body which means that the plane can now be collided into, but it will not be affected by the object in the way that it won't go flying off when it gets collided into. And then I'll select both cones and apply a gravity. And I'll just pull this cone over here and hit play and see what happens. So, you know, it's fun. Oh, it went off the side. <laughs> there they go. So that's essentially using spring constraints. They're pretty interesting. You can play around with them and see what kind of results you get. Now there is also, if I select the constraint, you'll see there's this constraint on or off. If I turn this off and then hit play, the constraint is essentially turned off and they're, they are no longer springing together or anything. And this can be keyframed, so if you want the spring to be on at a certain point and then turned off, and then turn back on, you, over the course of the timeline, you can do that by setting keyframes for the constraint setting. So that's the spring constraint in Maya. I hope you enjoyed the video and learned more about the spring constraint. If you have any questions or if you think I missed anything, please let me know in the comments and I'll be sure to address those issues. Uh, thanks again for watching, and I'll talk to you later.